Okay, what's going on, everybody? Um, welcome back. This is episode two of the soon to be named podcast by Fox Hire. I've got John Lindesmith, our VP of product here today, and uh, we are excited to talk to you guys. Um, if you don't know, today is, uh, or if you're watching in the future, um, day after some of the NFL playoffs, so I've got my Chiefs gear on. I couldn't not have it on today. So, um, Excited to see what, what happens uh, in in the playoffs going forward. But um, we're talking about today uh, really something that direct hire recruiters uh, would care about. So if you're a direct hire recruiting firm or if you're an independent headhunter or something that does direct hire either uh, primarily or exclusively, this is a great opportunity for you to learn about a new way to expand your business. And that's about uh, – or that is through contract staff. So um, I've got John here. John's been uh, really working with direct hire recruiters that are that look to expand into contract staffing for a long time, longer than me. Um, but it's a pretty straightforward concept to think about um, when you really get into it. And it's really just about being able to say yes, right? Like being able to say yes to more business. So um, I mean, that's the theme that I think about, John. I don't know if you have anything else to add there, but that's the theme that I think about, just like being able to say yes when a client wants you to do contract staffing. I don't know if there's something you want to add there. No, I think that's the big part for me too. And actually talking about the playoffs, just going back to that for a second, I was, it got me thinking, do you see all the um, snow shovelers that were shoveling Buffalo Stadium? Yes. Do you think- I thought about this. Did they independent contractor them, you think? I don't know. Was it a 1099? Was it a W2? I just thought of that. I'm not quite sure. I heard they're getting paid twenty dollars an hour. So, you know, if there was an EOR that did that uh, or a staffing firm, I would assume it's probably going to be like pay real or uh, um, cast and crew. Those guys do events, events stuff like that. That would be their their vibe. But the workers' comp risk on that, like slipping and falling, has got to be like maximum maximum level. I. Yeah, there was, they showed like the time lapse of them doing it. it. I mean, it's it was a lot of people going through each of the rows, which is crazy. Yeah. And then the first thing, of course, I thought about, because I got nothing else better to think about, is like, okay, who's hiring those people to be able to pay them 20 bucks an hour? And Exactly. It, I Technically, you might be able to pass like the ABC test for independent contractors, but I you don't know. You probably could. I, I, I was thinking that too. Like they brought their own shovels, so technically like they didn't provide any equipment. Like there's yes. some... Uh, some things that I was like, yeah, they probably just 1099 to all those people. And it was, that was two or three days, two weeks in a row at 20 bucks an hour. Like some people were cleaning up if they were like, I thought they were doing it like all day long, like 24 hours. It's not a bad, it wasn't a bad gig. If you had a shovel that was decent and a lot of like warm gear, basically. That's interesting. I don't know. I would really like to know the answer to that. If anybody knows, please let me know. Yeah. Um, I was trying to think of anybody up in Buffalo. I live in Cleveland and same thing. We have an open stadium and we got like eight inches outside. And I was like, we would have had to do the same thing probably if, you know, the world freezes over and the Browns actually host a playoff game one time in this time of the area. <laughs> that would be really nice. But well, we'll have to ask problem, boy. Not a problem we have to worry about so far. I think your time will come. I we'll have to ask our boy Brad Biley up in Buffalo from That's Haley true. Marketing. I bet you they I bet you he knows the answer to that question. Very possible. Yeah. They, they did a good job. So, yes, going back to the yes, that, that is the big thing for sure, is being able to say yes. No, even if you don't specify, and you know, like specialize yourself in contract staffing, if you can say yes to those jobs, like it does open up a ton of avenues that we're going to talk about over the next, you know, 20 or so minutes on expanding your business and, you know, doing more for your, for your clients and your candidates in that, in that case as well. Yeah, no doubt. Well, I guess, what are some of the things that typically hold people back from doing contract staffing? Um, And I think even before we start that, let's just define what we're talking about. Like contract staffing is um, finding a temporary employee or a contract employee that uh, your client wants for a a fixed period of time, right? Like three months, nine months, something like that, where um, traditional staffing firms will be the legal employer of that staff member and they'll send an invoice every week for their time. Um, that's the general gist of what we're talking about. So if you're like, what is contract staffing? That's it, right? Instead of like direct hire is I find a person, they take the job, 
that client employs that person and I get a fee for that. Um, that's called direct hire, right? We're talking about contracting, which is you remain the employer of that staff member and you're sort of lending them, leasing them to the, your client for a period of time and they pay you on a weekly basis versus like one big uh, finder's fee, if that makes sense. So just to set the table, that's really what that is. Um, what holds people back, John? What, what, like, what are some of the main excuses? Like, eh, I don't want to do it because of what? The big, the big thing that I that always pops into my mind, and it's like when we talk to our sales team or anyone that's selling it, it's like we're first talking to people that if they don't do it before, we have to sell them first on doing it because they think it's so hard to do it. Like they don't, they don't know what they're doing. They're so used to talking in like direct hire language. They're like contracting. Like I have to learn this whole new process for doing, you know, for making a, you know, for doing a search and making a placement. Like I don't want to be able to to do that. Like I have enough things to worry about than having to take time to learn the process. So it's like, it's too difficult. It's complicated. You know, it's too much work. We, we hear that a lot. Um, the other thing that we hear about is, you know, I'm getting these big fat direct hire checks. Like there's not that much profit in contract staffing. So why would I spend the time to get to learn a new process? If, you know, I'm not going to be seeing those big paychecks at the end of them. Um, yeah for the big retainer fees. So that's, that's another one that we hear about a lot. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, those are the big, the two big ones. And to be fair, like the contract staffing, um, running your own back office is, uh, is somewhat difficult. Like compared to direct hire staffing, it's definitely harder. Um, uh, the, the recruitment process though is the same, right? So like, that's the main thing for the people that think, okay, this is totally different. Um, you know, I've found that most recruiters that are selling recruit, uh, direct hire recruitment are doing a pre pretty similar process for contract staffing. Now, that can change as you get into like really, really heavy volume opportunities where there's like multiple, multiple, multiple people, maybe in the, you know, dozens or hundreds of people for one big push. But if you're just doing like contract staffing for 10 or less people, um, for you know, per project, it's, it's really similar pro process, you know. Um, so I would say like the recruitment process is less different than you'd expect. Um, but the difficulty really comes in the back office, which there are some things to think about there. But luckily, there's some really great solutions that are really mature and highly adopted in, our, in the staffing and recruiting market to solve for those problems. So really eliminates a lot of those headaches. And I think checking that box really just makes it so much easier. Just being able to say yes is, is almost um, not a problem if, if you are able to use some of those, those solutions, which we'll talk about. Um, I think the last one, though, that I would say that holds people back is people don't even know that it's an opportunity. Like, people don't even know that, like, one, their clients are buying contract staffing. So, and I got a thumbs up there. Um, so, our clients are buying contract staffing, right? Like, if you're a direct hire recruiter and you only talk to your hiring manager about direct hire, you may not even know that they get contract staffing elsewhere. Or there could be a buyer inside of your client that, is responsible for contract staffing that you just don't have access to. And you would never even know to talk to because they've pigeonholed you as the direct hire person, their direct hire firm. So another thing is just like knowing it's even available to be offered. I think part of the gig economy coming into like such a big focus over the last few years, we, we used to have to tell people what contracting was like first yeah. time I remember I even took the job and was trying to explain to people like what Fox hire did. I was like, all right, I'm only going to do this once. So I had like 20 people in a group. I'm like, just let's just gonna take 20 minutes and just explain what this is all about. Basically. Then I don't have to do it all over again. Um, Cause it was complicated. Yeah. Now, now we, we have to do less of that. It feels like, which is nice. Yeah. Cause, cause people do realize that like contracting is a thing, but I think the big thing that you're saying as well, like the lack of understanding that it's an opportunity is a great point because people might just assume that their clients don't do it which I think is a bad assumption because of the current environment that there is going to be opportunity. Like you said, they just need to ask and it's probably somebody else placing those people. So like, why shouldn't that be you in this case? hundred percent. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, that's a great segue into like the types of contract staffing. The gig economy is definitely one of those things, right? So like if you're taking a job on Fiverr or your client is hiring somebody off of Fiverr or Upwork or wherever, um, that's contract staffing. That's exactly what that is. And the firm that's placing those people is Upwork, you know, like mm -hmm. that's exactly what uh, we're talking about here. And so um, the gig economy has, like you said, really brought the majority of the public into the understanding of like what contract staffing is. Right. So, you know, I know that one of the questions people would have is like, 
as a job seeker, why would I take a contract job over a full-time job? And while that's still a question for a lot of people, you know, it's, it's more like um, supplemental work as well. That's done on a contract basis, two, three days a week or on the side, you know, side gigs is always um, side hustles is always the term people throw around. So um, the gig economy and gig work is definitely uh, one way people are doing contract staffing, which is pretty interesting. Um, then there's the traditional W-2, right? Um, W-2 long-term contract staffing, right? Um, that is a very widely adopted and heavily utilized uh, type of contract staffing. The most, I think, well-known of those is probably like um, healthcare and healthcare, which is uh, travel nurses. Travel nurses are typically W-2 employees and they work on long-term fixed contracts, um, whether that's three months, six months, nine months, and they keep extending them if they would like or not. But W-2 contract staffing is um, something that most uh, organizations are leveraging at some level. So really interesting to hear like, oh, that's not an opportunity or um, my clients don't need that or whatever the case may be. I think I would, I would uh, beg to differ on that one. Mm-hmm. Um, so John, other ones that you see when talking to our recruiting uh, partners um, about staffing or contract staffing, other types. Yeah, like one of the, the big buzz words these days, especially because there's so many legal um, filings coming out of it, especially I, was it last week or the week before when another when the Biden administration uh, issued another filing on corp to corp slash independent contract. Yes. Um, so that's huge. And obviously, you know, 1099s or corp to corps, independent contractors um, have been utilized for a long, long time and to the point where they're also getting more and more recognition. Um, but it's certainly a way of staffing that should be mentioned here as it's definitely prevalent. And, you know, if you're in any type of a search, um, you can utilize that just to position yourself as an expert to say like, hey, do you have p- people that are working on an independent contract? Um, but you can also utilize that as an opportunity because there are a number of court filings coming down to make sure that workers are being classified correctly. And if you're able to position yourself again as an expert, you can suggest having those workers converted to a W-2, which would, you know, you know, you can get some sort of a percentage off of that if you can, you know, be the middleman to put them in with a, with an AOR that's able to employ them. So um, that's another type that I would mention. And then the other one is like a attempt to perm model, which would be, um, you know, you, uh, the company would put a worker on as a temporary employee first with the option and expectation that they would eventually get hired on full time uh, to that organization, which is, there's a lot of benefits to both parties involved with that kind of relationship, because, you know, the candidate can get themselves in the door at potentially a company that they would like to work on in the future to, and then they use this trial period as a way to make sure that they want to work at that company and, you know, be able to then convert themselves over into a full-time employee. And it comes with the client getting the satisfaction of it's a little bit more of a low risk opportunity to start off with for them where they're not paying the, the, the upfront like hiring cost right off the bat. They get to like try before you buy type of model. Um, so that's a, that's a really cool method to utilize in a, in a bunch of situations. Um, and it also really benefits the recruiter that places that candidate because they would be able to get themselves the recurring revenue that we're going to talk about here shortly of contracting um, and then combine that with the permanent fee at the end if they do convert over um, at the end of that contract assignment. So definitely a huge opportunity involved with that as well. No doubt. Yeah, I think that method, so temp to perm or contract to direct, is the easiest to incorporate if I'm a direct hire recruiter and I want to start doing contract staffing for the first time. And, you know, we've seen anecdotally that that could increase your closing percentage of like direct hire fees or conversion fees by about 10%. So like you could close one more of every 10 placements just by being able to say yes to a temp to perm assignment that you would otherwise have lost, right? And I'll go through some specific examples of when that might be the case. So number one is probably the most common, which is like 
a client is on the fence about a candidate, they're like, yeah, you know, this candidate's all right. I, you know, they could be good, but maybe we'll just wait a little bit longer to see if we can find the unicorn or the purple squirrel or whatever it is they call it, right? Um, or vice versa, right? The candidate's like, oh, you know, I don't know if I want to take this job. I'm sort of like where I'm at. And, uh, but, but, you know, if it was just a little bit better, maybe I would take it. If any of those cases come up, anybody's on the fence, attempt a perm assignment is really, really great to solve for that because of the try before you buy component of this, right? So on the client side, it's like, hey, client, listen, I get it. You know, Joe Schmo, really great candidate. You're not super sold or 100% on board. Why don't we try Joe on a temp to firm assignment? So give him a shot, 30, 60, 90 days. And if you feel like he's doing a great job, we can convert him to a full-time employee. We can do a conversion fee at that time. But during those 30, 60, 90 days, you just pay me a, um, a weekly, you know, fee for the hours that Joe works. But if you don't like him, you can always just, you know, move him off the assignment and uh, try to find somebody else. No harm, no foul. Um, much less uh, or a much lower cost or barrier to entry to get that person in the door. That's a great option to close a candidate or a, or a client on a, on a candidate that you would have otherwise had to say no to. Like that person wouldn't have been placed. And who knows if you ever replace that person with a different candidate, right? That's one. Uh, that's one scenario where this would work out. Um, the other scenario where this is really valuable is when you face budget constraints. Um, and those can typically come from like uh, either end of the year um, hiring freezes. So Q4, a lot of publicly traded companies, a lot of companies in general, they'll pause hiring. So they'll do a hiring freeze. And if you're a, a hiring manager and you are in a recruitment process for somebody and then you've got to say, hey, sorry, you know, recruiter can't. Um, hire this person, hiring freeze, right? Typically, headcount budgets are different, different uh, classifications within the budget than vendor budgets. And so um, what a lot of times will happen is uh, you wanted to place somebody on a direct hire and the client did also, but there's this budget constraint caused by a hiring freeze or something else that they have to work around. And so what you can offer is, hey, why don't we put them on attempt to perm? We'll pull from a different budget over that period of time. Whenever that hiring freeze is um, ended, let's just call it January 1st, we can convert this person to a full-time employee and do a conversion fee at that time. You know, you might even get paid the same amount of money, but in general, the client gets the person they need, the candidate gets the job and you get the fee. Everybody wins, even though there's this hiring freeze that would have otherwise killed the deal, right? Those are like really two really easy ways to get started by just being able to say yes to attempt to perm assignment. And I, I really like those. I think that's like the easiest, most, um, understandable way to to start things out this goes along with your first scenario too but the the one that i i've seen and i i saw this first mention um at staffing world johnny taylor from sherm was talking about the huge skills gap problem that we're that we're encountering right now and like these difficult searches where they're trying to find this very highly skilled unique individual to like fill a particular role it's, it's going to be very difficult now and in the future to find people that have all that, the skills that they're expecting in that job. Um, they might not even be able to find them at all. So you can utilize that, you know, temp to perm method to try out someone that maybe comes close to having all the skills, but not quite all of them and see if yeah. they're able to elevate themselves up to that level of what they're expecting. And if they are great, you know, hire them full time and you have your person. If not, then you know, it's a lower cost and lower risk way of um, trying to find somebody that you need without wasting time, you know, months and months and months trying to find that needle in the haystack. So that's a that's a great scenario to kind of work with as you're coming through with some difficult searches like that. Yeah, no doubt. I think that's a great option as well. Um, just working off the last this list, right, of, of, of types of contract staffing. The last one I would mention is per diem. So per diem is like shift work, very similar to like gig work. Gig economy would be taking those shifts from an app or some like online type of platform. Per diem is a similar model, other but it's just through a staffing firm traditionally. So um, pick up a shift, let's just say as a nurse at the local long-term care facility, pick up one or two shifts a week. Instead of being on a long-term contract for 40 hours per week, you're uh, able to take shifts here and there. And you're sort of in a pool of workers that 
all are looking to take a uh, shift here and there. And that type of per diem staffing model works well in healthcare because of the amount of facilities that might be local to each candidate and the need they have. And so uh, per diem is also just another type of contract staffing that exists that you could look into if you wanted to offer or add that to your business. Um, but let's talk about the benefits of contract staffing for a recruiting firm. And I, you know, the first one that comes to mind is recurring revenue. Um, and recurring revenue is a lot of times associated with like software businesses, but really recurring revenue can be anything that provides revenue without you having to go sell another thing, right? So you, you don't have to go sell another uh, trinket or place another candidate to get money, right? And that's really where um, you are with direct hire, right? Like you're on this hamster wheel with direct hire that you're only as good as your last placement. You got to keep making more placements in order for you to make money. And the smaller your firm is, the more that pressure is upon you as the individual to, to execute that process. And because of that, I think, John, you can agree, maybe talk about this a little bit. You are uh, highly affected by the uh, financial um, environment, either of the economy of, or, or even of just your client base. Like if a couple of clients aren't doing well, even if the economy is good or if the economy makes things really tough, direct hire firms really have a hard time. Yeah. So I, and that's that's kind of what we talked about. It, exactly. Like kind of bridging the gap between the peaks and val valleys of direct hire staffing is something that we preach a lot of. And you know, yeah. there are very frequent dips that that happen at random times in some cases. So if you can have that steady stream of recurring revenue, it does become that like it increases your floor as a business to be able to like manage those cases. What and many times you really can't do anything about them like you can't control certain economic mm -hmm. and you know whatever kind of factors that you might be dealing with at that time um along with the recurring the thing i always like to think of that i heard someone at a conference once talk about the benefits of contract staffing and the way he put it which i always remember now is uh, especially now that i'm i want to be on a beach because it's really cold outside but um is that he literally can go to the beach and make money while he's sitting by the pool because of the recurring revenue that he has set up through his contracting business. So he's literally on vacation mm -hmm. making money because he's getting paid off of every hour that the contractors that he put on assignment are working, which is bringing in yep. that revenue, no matter what he's doing, you know, whatever, whatever the recruiter's doing or, you know, whatever, like it, they're going to be making that money regardless, um, yeah. which is a really cool thing to say about contracting. You can't necessarily say about, direct hire. Um, yeah, no doubt. The other no thing, doubt I, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say like, um, people always talk about like passive income, right. And like, Oh, this is passive income, right? Like we should find a way to make passive income. This isn't necessarily hundred percent passive. So I would warn against that. Like you do have to keep making placements because eventually those people will stop working, whatever the case may be. Right. Like, you know, at Fox hire, we do have people that have been on for years and years and years, but the majority of contract staffing placements last like, six, nine, 12 months, 12 months at the longest. Um, anything after that is a little bit rarer than, you know, the previous t like amounts of time of, of people that might, that might be working. But in general, um, if you can get a consistent process where you have three, six, five, 10 people on assignment, like John said, when you do face situations like we have had in the last couple of years specifically, right? Whether it was like right during the beginning of COVID or after COVID, and we've got this, you know, down economy the last couple of years. There's been a lot of people saying there's no job orders. There's no job orders. Uh, but if you had been working on a contract staffing business prior to that, when you've had those people working, it is going to smooth out that cash flow. And when you don't have a direct hire placement or the amount of direct hire placements you want in a given month, that cash coming in from contract staffing is going to be a great supplement. Yep, definitely. And that kind of leads us, the, the cash involved in the recurring revenue is kind of leads us into our next thing that we wanted to talk about, which is the fact that, and, and I, I'll let Colin, I'll let you talk about this because you you do as good a job as anybody that I've heard explain it before, but um, that recurring revenue and having contractors on assignments makes it a lot, makes your, makes your business a lot more valuable and yep. puts it in a better position to eventually sell. I know when, when the time comes for that. Yeah, no doubt. Contract staffing helps your organization build enterprise value, right? So even if you're a one man or one woman shop, contract staffing helps you build 
a business that can actually be sold when you want to be done. I don't know any business owner that wants to work their whole lives and then not be able to sell that business at the end of the day. That's half of the retirement capability you have as a small to mid-sized staffing firm or recruiting firm is the ability to sell that business at the end of the day. Um, and I've been following a lot of really interesting stats uh, about the, the previous generation to mine, um, or I guess two generations ago, the, uh, the baby boomers. And they have like tons and tons of businesses, this, this, this uh, generation, but almost 70 plus percent, I think, are going to um, retire and not have anybody to take that business over. They're just going to close it down. And I think that's the case uh, for a lot of recruiting, uh, or recru independent recruiters or recruiting agencies in general. They don't have buyers. And if they do have buyers, the uh, valuation that they're going to get is going to be very limited because buyers uh, don't want to base their purchase off of um, unpredictable revenue numbers, right? If you've ever gotten to a conversation about selling your business, it's about EBITDA, right? Which is basically net profit, right? What's your net profit every single year? How, where is that coming from? Is it coming from recurring revenue or not recurring revenue, right? And so if you're a recruiter, it's not recurring revenue. Once you retire, you're done. Like they can't get more revenue from you. You are retired. So therefore, what are they even buying? But if you have a contract staffing business and you have a set amount of clients that come to you for contract staff on a consistent basis, and you can show repeatable and sustainable business um, growth and revenue growth from that channel, you will be able to generate uh, an EBITDA number that's based off recurring revenue. And therefore, somebody will pay for that. Somebody will buy your company. And I don't know anybody that wouldn't want that because that's going to set you up for a much better retirement. And you're, you know, all that work you did over all those years won't go in vain. Like you can actually do something or pass it down or anything, but if you don't have that. It's tough. Could set yourself up earlier to retire too, which is. Yeah, no doubt. Also that sounds even better. So. I mean, yeah, we've had clients that have sold their businesses, um, recruiting and staffing firms that were direct hire firms even to begin with. And they added contract staffing and then 20 years later, they sell their company and uh, that, none of that would have happened. Right. If they didn't say, Hey, I think we should do contract staffing. And so, um, Enterprise value, I think, is the most important benefit of contract staffing because it takes your business from um, one dimensional and, and something nobody would buy to really an enterprise that you can um, ultimately sell at the end of the day, which, which is a really great benefit. So, yeah, I think that's a big one. Um, another thing I would highlight as a benefit as you're going into some of these sales cycles is uh, I think last year in April, the uh, SIA, Staffing Industry Analysts, did a survey on the priorities for staffing buyers, so people that buy staffing services. And the number one priority that CEOs of staffing buyers had in that survey was vendor consolidation, right? So I think through COVID and through you know some of the years pre preceding that, there was a, a lot of different staffing firms brought in um, at a number of companies that were all, I guess, being surveyed here, but the market wasn't looking to to um, consolidate all those vendors. Instead, they opened up their um, appetite to many different vendors. And so a lot of people got into all these companies and now they're selling and all that type of stuff. But ultimately, like these CEOs and CFOs are like, hey, we need to consolidate this book of vendors to the ones we can trust or a limited number for whatever reason they're going to justify with um, performance level or costs or whatever the case may be, right? And so if you can't be a sole source supplier, if you can't deliver contracting, direct hire together, um, then you might be a candidate for consolidation because they're going to go get that from somebody else that can. And so one of the things I think contract staffing also does is protects you from vendor consolidation, which is a top priority right now uh, across the staffing buyer landscape. Yep. And like we talked about earlier, someone's doing it because almost all businesses are using some form of contracting. So no, no. it could be one of your competitors. And ultimately you want to be I mean, I'm assuming, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I'm assuming you want to be whoever your contact at that company's first call when it comes to any of their staffing needs, because then you can start your searches quicker, find the right candidates and, and grow your business. And if you can't, if you can do all of the types of staffing that they're looking for, then you quickly will become their first call to be able to find the right candidate for any type of role that they're going to be placing. So like Colin said, that one-stop shop is huge. And I think it also goes into you know I, another thing I mentioned earlier. It's just becoming that 
that like like almost like more of a resource um, and not like an actual vendor. So you you kind of become the person that they that they come to when they need advice and positions yourself in, in kind of a role of authority with them um, to help them out. So I think that's a, a very important piece is to, if you can offer everything, then yes, it, it, you don't, you're not going to get consolidated most likely. Yeah. And I would say a lot of this consolidation comes through like partnerships that your clients might have with managed service providers who are tasked with reducing costs, you know, getting all the vendors into one place, making sure that everybody understands how to use vendors and all that type of stuff. So if you can't offer contract staffing, the odds of getting into an MSP program is pretty limited because the majority of the MSP spend is on contract staffing. And so um, if you can't get into your client uh, to even start the conversation because you don't even do contract staffing, you're going to be limited. And I think a lot of the recruiters that, that we worked with have clients that never used an MSP and now all of a sudden do. And because of that, there's these new processes and they're sort of limited in how they can even work with their client now because they don't offer contract staffing, which I think is really, really important to think about is when your client adopts an MSP or VMS, how will you react if you don't have contract staffing on the books? That's an important thing to think about. Um, so it's like, all right, I think that's a good summary of like, why should contract staffing be in your playbook? A lot of great reasons. You can get into depth on all of those things. Tons of great resources out there to go explore some of those use cases and some of those benefits. But if you're like, how can I even do that? I don't have a back office. I don't run payroll. I just doing direct hire. What do I do? A lot of great options. You know, we're obviously employer record company. Um, certainly could be a back office option for you. It's not the only option. So we're going to go through a couple of them just really quickly. Um, and we'll just start with the EOR because, I, you know, and we'll just go in order this way, like from most all-encompassing to least all-encompassing. Um, EOR is like the complete package. If you say, hey, like, I don't know how to get started with this. I don't like the risk. I don't uh, have payroll funding. I want to offer benefits. I want to be able to deliver a really good solution to my clients. And EOR is, is a one-stop shop for all of that, right? If you want to be able to offer contract staffing tomorrow, EOR is the method because you can literally call somebody like us or any number of EORs out there in the market. Certainly encourage you to do your research, find the best one for you. But that would be the method you would need to use is EOR because they deliver everything. One-stop shop. A lot of them come with software as well, like we do, uh, to make it easy. But EOR is like you're basically outsourcing your back office and it's turnkey, ready to go right now. That's what an employer of record does. And they'll be the legal employer of the temps. And all you have to do is do what you normally do. Find a candidate, find a client, sell them on the job. EOR does literally everything else. That would be option number one. Um, option number two is payroll funding. Uh, payroll funding is just the component where a lot of people will raise their hand and say, I don't have the cash to start contract staffing. I sort of, you know, I'm a business owner. I can do the back office, maybe run payroll and do timesheets and get, make sure I'm good with workers comp and stuff like that. But, um, I don't have the cash to pay my employees before I get paid. And that's a big barrier to entry for a lot of, um, staffing and recruiting from owners. So I would say that's a that's an important one um, to consider is payroll funding if you just focused on the cash. What are your thoughts, John? What other ones would you highlight? Um, invoice factoring is another one, I think, is an option you can use, which is, you know, kind of similar to payroll funding, but um, has more to do with the, the invoices involved. And then the other option is back office software. So doing it yourself. Um, and, and obviously, you know, the first three you're, you're, you know, buying a software or you're using another third party solution, doing it yourself is obviously a great option for a lot of people. And it really just depends on your situation, I think, because although it's great to be able to do it yourself, it, it does set, it does cost a lot internally for your company to be able to, to do it in a way that you can actually expand and grow your business. Um, like there's a lot of staffing firms that we talk to who are like, I do contracting in one state and I know exactly how to do it in that state and I'm not planning on expanding. And, and that's great for that business, obviously. Like they have exactly what they want and they're comfortable with that. But if you're a business and you have a scenario where you do want to grow, sometimes it can be quicker to look elsewhere. So it really, no matter of all the four methods we talked about, it really depends on, you know, your situation and what you need to do to be able to like evaluate what solution is going to be best for you and your company. 
Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I think um, back office software, something to consider if you do want to run your own back office, find some good back office software that'll help you. I know, you know, Bullhorn One, uh, Aviante Bold, you've got Bill Flow, you know, there's a lot of different options out there. So consider that. But, you know, those are a few ways to get started. And, um, you know, in general, I would urge you to consider it if you are a direct hire firm, look at contract staffing. It's a great opportunity to grow your business, build enterprise value, increase your closing percentage. And there's great solutions to help you get started quickly. So um, in general, I think it's a great decision for all recruiting staffing uh, professionals to get started in contract staffing. And uh, I don't know if you have anything else to add, John, but. I just say it doesn't take that long or that much resources to get started either. Like there's little things you can start doing today, really, that will allow you to start that process. Like it's not like you have to change your entire business or come up with some huge six month, two year business plan to do it. Like if you, I think it's the two big things that you would need to start doing now is you're building your candidate pool and asking your clients. Like you could do that on the phone call that you make in 10 minutes with one of your big clients as just incorporating the question. Like, do you place contractors? Like if so, then boom, you have a client that you can start placing in. Like just asking that question alone will start positioning yourself as a source of yep. being able to fund those positions. And then candidates, same thing. Like you can ask them in their in your questionnaires, your phone calls and interviews, whatever, as you're talking with them, are you willing to work on a contract? If yes, then they go into the contract candidate pool and you can start pulling from that pool as you're building it over time. So two small things that you can get going with really quick. Um, I just want to dispel the kind of the notion that, that some people think like it's going to take this huge effort to do it when it's not necessarily the case. So um, definitely stuff that you can do right away to get started. No doubt. Well, I appreciate it, guys. I hope that was helpful for you guys. And um, we look forward to doing more of these podcasts and giving you some information that we have just from working in the market. Um, We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. The podcast to be named later. To be named. To be named later. It'll have a name soon. But It will. Yes. All right, guys.